please welcome to the stage EVP National Sales, the CW, Rob Tuck. All right, best for last, right? Did I say that? I shouldn't have said that. Um, half of these, half of the words on these cards have already been said, uh, but I'm going to take a, a few moments to make to uh, to give you a few words. Uh, as we all know, consumers have more choices than ever before. You haven't heard that today, right? Uh, to watch their favorite shows, whether it be on TVs, computers, phones, or tablets. This now provides you, the advertisers, um, more opportunity to reach them, and with so many options available. What keeps them engaged on every platform is what? Great broadcast content. Come on, come on. Um, as broadcasters, we know that we're held to a higher standard. Viewers expect high quality programming from us, both in our content, but also in the way that we deliver that content to them. And, uh, and it's only by meeting that standard that we're able to reach this big audience and keep them engaged. And as the media landscape has changed, it's not that content is king, it's premium content that is king. Remember that. Uh, so before we break for uh, cocktails, here to talk about premium content uh, are George Blue from Fox, Mark Debois, my French, uh, from CBS, my colleague Brian Darty at the CW, Dan Levenger from NBC, and Pooja Mitha from ABC. And to help lead this conversation, I'd like to introduce the moderator, the CMO of Vindico, John Schultz. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Um, Good evening, everybody. I know we're standing between you and cocktails, so uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep this moving along. Uh, what I wanted to do um, real quickly is kind of set up the topic for today. Um, this is a little bit different because I know a lot, a lot of the previous sessions were more on content, uh, the last one a lot on measurement. But uh, as Rob set up, we're going to start to talk a little bit about um, content and how it's, how it's being consumed and how it's being consumed on different platforms. Um, where, where do we sit in the ecosystem? Vindico is basically the largest online ad serving platform for video. So when people aren't watching it on their television, they're consuming it online or they're consuming it from digital devices. We're serving that advertising, we're measuring it, and we're actually moving into a, a phase now where we're focusing on the quality and, and the quality of those experiences. Um, you don't have a lot of challenges when it's on the big screen in the household. But when, when you start to get to other devices, the landscape gets a little bit more clouded. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about some stats um, around the space and around the quality uh, that we see in the space to kind of set up the Q&A with this panel to talk a little bit in more detail. So just a little bit about Vendico and a little bit about Adtricity. Vendico serves about 40% of the online video ads. Um, for the major media companies, it's more like 70%. So we're very familiar with the, the major media. It's a, it, we, we represent about 350 brands out there and we're MRC accredited. The tool that I'm going to spend time talking about stats from is actually our Adtricity tool. And Adtricity we launched about two years ago and it's really there to focus on viewability and quality. Um, and I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is give you a handful of stats. There, there's some things on the slide here, but I'm going to go through a few stats and you can see how we delineate this a little bit. So starting with, with, with viewability, if you look at uh, the, the ecosystem at large, again, major media being one part of it, portals, networks, exchanges, kind of looking at the whole gamut, about 45% of ads are viewable. And they're viewable by the new definition um, from the IAB, which is basically two continuous seconds, 50% of, of the ad is viewed. <coughs> okay, so a little less than half. And that number's remained pretty constant over the last couple years as we've been measuring that. If you dig into that number and you break that up a little bit, um, you'll see major media, which is represented by the, the, the panel here, is about 65%. Um, internet brands, that would be more like portals, Yahoo, MSN, AOL, 47%. Uh, and then the ad networks and exchanges, 
uh, about 37%. And again, that's viewability against that standard. If you look at the execution of the digital video, and I'm, I'm sure as all of you use the internet, you see a lot of different player sizes. Um, if you look at, again, these three breakouts, you look at the major media, 75% of the content is being delivered through a large player. That's 700 pixels or greater. That's a big player, largely above the fold, that's, that's delivering that content. When you look at the internet brands and the uh, networks and exchanges, you can see what a small percentage that is on the, on the large players, and that's more to the, the medium and the small players. So you've got the in-banner advertising, you've got some of the thumbnail players, uh, a little bit less uh, engaging from that standpoint. And then finally, and this is starting to come up more and more, um, is the non-human traffic. Uh, what I'm referring to here is bots. Um, you know, not all of it is bad. Some of it is, it, there's crawlers out there that do measurement uh, for statistics and capturing, but there is, there are some bad actors out there. And, and there is, there is uh, you know, a, a problem that needs to be managed. And again, as you can see in terms of bot traffic across the landscape, um, the networks and exchanges, the internet brands, and of course major media. And major media, it's, it's all about transparency uh, and, and their focus on, on, on managing that. So um, I, ju I just wanted to give you a little color to kind of set it up. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to spend um, the, the rest of the time really kind of digging in with this panel to talk about these numbers and kind of get behind these numbers a little bit. So. Um, from the ad adtricity research, you, you saw a clear difference from uh, major media, internet brands, and exchanges. I'm going to direct this first one to you, Brian. Um, can you talk a little bit about how this is, is really not an accident and, and really the strategies employed by major media help drive this? Yeah, I mean, you know, this whole afternoon we've been talking about the content, and uh, we collectively have the best content there is. But the real thing that we had to concentrate on is how we were going to distribute that content. Um, and so we had to strategize a few years ago when we saw what was happening to our linear ratings. And we decided that you know, we needed to keep what advertisers were going to expect out of us is the highest quality player um, with the greatest experience, as good as if not better than what they were getting out of the broadcast network. And so when we went to market, we decided that we were obviously going to concentrate on two main beneficiaries of our video player, uh, the viewer making sure that that content was distributed across as many places as we could get it to be um, so that they had the ability to see the programming when and where they wanted. Um, and also, most importantly, the advertiser. Um, you know, and I think that we have uh, you know, tried as, well as, as much as we could to get the advertiser to have a place at any of those platforms uh, throughout the process. And now we look back, and I think you know, what we've created, again, our, our sites, um, it is 100% above the fold, high definition, widescreen players. Um, we're offering a lot of the same controls that they would expect out of our broadcast network with you know, category exclusivity within a pod. Um, we're starting to limit the amount of um, frequency that the ads are being um, aired, which is making it a better experience for the, um, for the, ad, for the viewer. Um, you know, I think collectively, again, we have been the ones to go to Nielsen and to, um, to Comscore to try and figure out measurement beyond the P2 plus um, to get demographic guarantees uh, established within the buys. And I think on the back end is the post analysis. I mean, we're telling our advertisers exactly where that programming is, where, what, where their ads are running, on what programs. And I think that we have you know, shown that we are best in class of distributing our content across digital platforms. So that's great. Thank hey, you. John, if I could just add in on that. Sure. Uh, yeah. you know, I support Brian's saying, but first, I think we all <laughs> applaud uh, what your company and others like it have done. And, in this verification business because it's essentially been proven out what we've been saying for years. I mean, our, our companies, essentially, we're all the same in that we do four things, and three of which are before ad sales. You know, we all create content, we distribute content, and we market and promote that content. And before we get to ad sales, this is exactly what we've been doing. Our charter agreements restrict our content to US only, which is so much of the fraud you speak of here. Of course, we're going to only put it above the fold in the best players because we're so proud of our content, we want consumers to see it. And so 
as we've got into this evolution of the introduction of ads into this content, into the digital marketplace, uh, you've proven out our theories. And you know what we say now, in a world where we're moving to mobile and moving to connected device as consumers are, and technology doesn't really allow certain verifications in these early stages, there's a little gap between consumption and the technology to allow verification, there really doesn't change the trusted source that all of us are. Mm -hmm. right? we, we have only these intentions of above the fold US because that's what our charter agreements are as companies, even without ANSA. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> another question, outside of full episode and, and long form programming, which you guys are obviously known for, what other types of offerings um, for broadcast video are being bought, brought to the, the web? I'm gonna start with you on this one, Pooja. Um, well, at the core of our offering is the broadcast video, but as someone in the last panel said, but wait, there's more. Um, we're really building out, and I think similar to the rest of my colleagues here, in three areas. The first is live streaming. We live stream daily on Watch ABC in our eight own markets. We are live streaming in multicam our major events like the Oscars, AMAs, or New Year's Eve. Uh, we actually just launched live streaming uh, for ABC News this past year um, on multiple new platforms, whereas before it was web only, and it's been a big success. Um, the second area I would say is doing derivative of our broadcast content. So for example, like a Nashville on the record music series or digital first content for the web. And it's been primarily short form to date, but we have a lot of other concepts in development. And what's great about this is that we're essentially working with the same consistent quality of talent and production in front of the camera, behind the camera, as our core broadcast offering. So it is extremely additive. And then the third area that we're building is actually to enhance the video experience. And I think you mentioned some things that we're all doing and pursuing with our players. But even beyond that, uh, for example, we've just launched some new features. One's called Social Lens, one's called Fast Share. And they're really just about enabling the behavior we know our viewers enjoy, which whether it's multitasking, sharing, or just interacting more deeply with the content. Great. George, anything from Fox? Yeah, I mean, much like uh, Pooja said, we have some <laughs> derivative content. You know, tonight we're launching Grace Point, and with that, that's like a murder mystery, and with that, we'll have a suspect tracker that'll have a lot of video influence. So anyone going out for cocktails today, please uh, drink heavily, and then tomorrow watch it on Fox.com. But the, uh, you know, those are very important. We, you know, we're certainly part of client-initiated or, or promoted derivative type content where we're matching content that matches their brand sensibilities with the themes of our shows. And the intent with those types of content experiences isn't so much to create reach, but to create impact. It's people that we expect that watch the show that want more information. And then, you know, really, I think that our phase that we're into now and have been for a little bit is creating original only digital content. And so we've launched some female empowerment and skewing dramas under the wigs umbrella. Uh, our Fox Digital Media Studios group has been creating content. They'll soon be releasing On Assisted Living, which is content that we're building <laughs> and creating, although distributing on other platforms outside of the Fox umbrella. Uh, we've worked with uh, Fox high definition uh, types of animation that we're putting out in market for the young men. Uh, and you know, we brought Gail Berman, who's a former programming chief at Fox back into the fold with the Jackal Group, which is digital only. And the intent there is to really get a footprint in digital only programming that will uh, extend across that ecosystem and not be related to the linear offering. Got it, good, thank you. Um, switching gears a little bit, live events like award shows and sporting events are often watched, you know, obviously live uh, rather than time shifted. Um, how do these franchises create unique online extensions for broadcasters? And Mark, I'm gonna throw this your way. Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, we all have a number of temples in our portfolio. A, a number of us have the Super Bowl. Uh, we have major sporting events. We have the Grammys on CBS. You have uh, ACMs on our, on our network as well. And what each of those provides us is a great opportunity to engage an audience on multiple platforms at the same time. Uh, so the Super Bowl a few years ago was a multi-camera uh, and deep statistical and social feed that we fed out to the world and got three million people to watch and set some pretty big records there. Uh, but it goes beyond that, I think, to even you know every you know the Grammys. Yes, we're going to give you back, backstage as, uh, access. But even on you know things like the ACMs, you actually get to vote for the winner, right? The Entertainer of the Year each year for the past, I believe, five has been voted on by the viewing public, predominantly via mobile. Um, and we've extended that to day-to-day -day, uh, things. Over the summer, Big Brother has a number of votes that are that are driven by uh, <laughs> on digital and driven and drive the the answers on the show. And then. You know, I even think about it as a day-to-day -day activity when you get to prime time. We, we launched uh, a couple years ago CBS Sync, uh, which was the opportunity to give extra content to viewers as they're watching 
uh, 11 different primetime shows in our network. And the real advantage that gave us was, you know, my team now has 11 writers in the writer's rooms of those shows creating original content around them and extending it onto other screens. So you may watch that content live, you may watch it after the fact, but we're, we're driving engagement for those viewers, you know, before, during, and after the show. And we think that dr uh, drives a tremendous opportunity for advertisers as well. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Dan, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, you can point to some of the obvious examples like the Olympics where, um, you know, starting with London, we took a big bet and gambled that um, using live streaming could actually <laughs> increase viewership, and in fact it did. Um, or even as recently as last week's, you know, Sunday Night Football, where we had, you know, 25 million um, views through our, our live app. But I, for me, in, in, in the sports genre, the, the best example of using digital and streaming to introduce and fuel a, a fandom is with Premier League football or soccer, mm -hmm. where um, most of the folks in the room probably know, um, but if you don't, we actually, um, on the NBC Sports Network, we broadcast a game every, every Saturday. And then every other game in the Premier League is actually available live streamed. And so if you're a Chelsea fan, but Chelsea's not playing on the sports network, you can be watching Chelsea right there and building your, your, your zeal for, for Premier League football. And it's working. I mean, we've had over 260 million minutes of streamed viewing in the first season. We've got um, over 13% of the people that have watched have said they've never watched soccer before on television. And we've got all these new folks that are coming and saying they love Premier League football. And that was a you know, franchise that, um, frankly, a lot of other people have tried to you know, bring to life. And I think through the use of digital <coughs> and streaming, we've been able to do it quite successfully. Um, you know, I, think, I think to talk to tent poles, um, you have to include a multi-platform experience for your, for your viewers. I mean, we just did it with the Emmys and, and brought Audi in. Um, with a really interesting campaign where we created original digital video. Um, we used NBC talent, very funny talent, created these comedic shorts, about 10 of them. Um, they ran before um, and during, and then we amplified it with something we call social sync, which is really Facebook and Twitter and, and, and sort of harnessing the power of them to amplify the voice. And um, again, great success. Audi was hugely thrilled. Um, but, you know, I think you have, you have the opportunity there and then you know, we, we launched something that there's, it, it's not a consumer driven thing, but we launched something called the NBC Comedy Store, which was an approach to crowdsource great comedic <coughs> talent. Um, we wanted to figure out how to bring great, fresh comedic voices to the screen. And so we offered people a chance to submit um, comedic shorts that could be extended into, you know, a 30 minute show. Um, we brought in NBC Talent as an advisory board. We had over 3,000 submissions. It got narrowed down to 500, eventually 40. The advisory board looked at 10 of them, and two will appear this summer as a one-hour block, two half-hour shows on NBC, and then there'll be a half an hour, another third one, which will appear digitally on NBC.com. So using digital as a way to source great programming is another, I think, example of, That's great. of the power of digital. That's really good. Uh, you mentioned social. That kind of takes me into uh, the next area. How are broadcasters leveraging social media extensions with popular shows to extend audiences and drive engagement for advertisers? Uh, Brian, I'll throw this one to you. Yeah, well, I mean, for us, you know, CW, we, we really use it as a dual approach. Um, the first and foremost, it's our biggest marketing tool. Um, it's our loudest microphone to connect to our you know, to our audience as we don't have the day parts that some of the other, you know, my, my friends here have um, to promote their shows. So we're really using it to drive, um, tune in and, 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 and engage with our audience. Um, and the second one is really it's they're asking for it. Our audience is really engaged in the, in the programming. They're wanting more of it. So we're giving them as much content to interact with throughout the week and beyond just the one hour episode that they might be really engaged in. And so it's built a lot of uh, you know, engagement around the entire uh, schedule. Um, you know, from an advertiser standpoint, it's a little more difficult, but we feel as if when we find the right environment and it's very relevant um, and it's organic, you can really cause a huge halo effect for an advertiser um, to reap the benefits of the association with the, with the program. So that's the way we're using it. Great. One thing I'll say about social, it's, there's a lot of talk about how 
you know, Twitter's driving TV ratings, and I think there's, there's a little bit less talk, and maybe there should be more, about how there wouldn't be anything to talk about on Twitter between, you know, 8 and 11 p.m. if there weren't great television programming there to, to do it. Yeah, I like that. Idea. Uh, and look, that's not all that Twitter's used for, and it's not all that Facebook's used for. There's, there, there are tremendous platforms, and they have a lot of users that are doing a lot of other things on them. But when it comes to, you know, I hear Twitter amplify all the time, and we're great partners with Twitter on that, on that specific program, but there's nothing to amplify if there isn't great video content from, you know, tremendous TV programming. We've done a lot of, you know, great things with them and some interesting things with Facebook, but I, I turn to that, that core <coughs> content has to be great, and it does have to be right for social. So, you know, we're going to find that news and sports are going to be slightly quicker and easier to deal with because it's going to be live and in the moment, and right. that's really what Twitter's about. But when you turn to something like Facebook, I'll use the reveal of the mother on How I Met Your Mother as a show that's canceled, so we're not competing over whether you can do that again <laughs> or not. But, I mean, that, that picture of that mother got shared 16 million times in an 18-hour period, right? I mean, an unbelievable number of shares because it was a big moment. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't necessarily about the instantaneous aspect of it, but just about the fandom of it. So we think that social's a great tool for us to tap into that engagement and those fans, and it's just taken the place of word of mouth. Now it's word of mouth and digital, and there's a tremendous opportunity. Great. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, George, this one uh, I'm sending your way. We've talked about digital extensions and how di you can do different things in digital, but there's also been some advances <laughs> in engagement and inter interaction with traditional TV. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, it's, it, on the, it's funny, on the derivative side where we're, you know, promoting interactions, particularly when we've got uh, brand partners that are working on promoting content or involved in the show. We've done, you know, Audrey was up here earlier and she runs our research and, I mean, she's got certainly normal qualitative measurements, but I mean, she's got psychographic companies we work with. I mean, biometrics, they're measuring people's pulse rate and heartbeat and their optic nerve. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's crazy, like the enthusiasm with which you see this digital consumption and then the overall lift that it gets in, in, the, in the user's mind. But, you know, the most- could sell that metric. Right, <laughs> we're, sell we're selling elevated heart rates now. I know. <laughs> but uh, the, like, the simplest thing to me and probably the most sensible is, you know, on a 30-day queue, we're probably seeing upwards of 20% of our impression delivery on a non-linear platform. And equal participation from a client across these non-linear platforms, we see ballpark 40% lift in both brand and message recall. And to me, that just tells the story. If you follow the audience, mm -hmm. you get rewarded. You yeah. just said one of the best things too, by the way. Oh, thanks. Thirty day, no, thirty day cum. It's like something we all ignore. We're looking at day of, three day, seven day. It's like the viewer's not thinking of it that way necessarily. And we have to look at that thirty day and not judge everything in this like two day vacuum of of usefulness. And and sort of now you look at VOD as a platform on cable and online and mobile and all these pieces. And you, you kind of have to start thinking about it in that thirty day cum. You know, metric. Otherwise, we're, we're just going to miss the boat in terms of where what viewers are actually doing, for, regardless of where you know advertising has to go on a day-to-day -day basis. Pooja, you and I were uh, talking about this actually back in the green room, but over-the-top delivery is really kind of on the rise, mm -hmm. right? I mean, digital's been there for a little bit for a little while, but mobile and over-the-top are really on the rise. Talk a little bit about over-the-top and what opportunities that presents from a content delivery. I think it presents uh, you know, a lot of opportunities for us. It is our fastest growing on-demand <laughs> platform right now. Um, about of our third of our full episode starts come from over the top. In addition, you know, we just launched our news live stream over the top on Apple TV. That was our first platform over the summer. And within the first month or the first few weeks, we saw three million streams. Um, and people were spending a lot of time with that stream. So we see it as you know, less of a new opportunity in that regard and more of just an extension of the relationship that our audience has with our content, an extension of the actual reach to that audience that we can bring to an advertiser. I think where it becomes a new opportunity and a really big opportunity is where we're headed, but we're not quite there yet. And that is that over the top represents you know, a DAI environment and a big one and a growing one and the best screen of choice for more and more people. And so the experiments that we're doing and the work we're doing to test and learn around data-driven targeting, around new ad formats, uh, the interactivity that that environment can offer in the living room, I think that's really exciting. And I feel like that's going to be that next big opportunity that it'll represent in a very rich way. But we're, we're moving towards that. Great. Dan, I want to talk a little bit about uh, programmatic buying. How, how mm -hmm. has that impacted your business, if at all? You hear a lot about it in the digital landscape but for major media. Right. Um, I wouldn't say it's impacted us a ton yet, but um, I think we'd all be fools to sit here and say it's not going to be impacting us a lot 
going forward, and the question is just how quickly. Um, we actually embrace the notion that programmatic can be great business for everybody. Um, whether you're looking at it as backroom automation that just helps people be more efficient on the cost side, or you're looking at it as, as, as a true um, automated um, exchange for inventory, or you're looking at it as a way to infuse data into that exchange of inventory, um, we think that it's a great opportunity. Um, we recently, as a matter of fact this week, um, announced the launch of NBCUX, which is our programmatic platform. Um, we have over 100 million uniques um, ready to be aggregated, sliced, diced, and consumed by advertisers and, and obviously viewers and users. And so for us, it's the beginning of what we think is a really great um, opportunity to heighten um, influence and in ROI, um, to make sure that we're truly getting at better um, information and um, ultimately um, ease of use, making people um, facile with these, these new exchanges is going to be the hard part, but um, we think that once people are, it's going to make, make our business a lot easier. Anyone else experimenting with, uh, with programmatic on the panel? I, on I the Fox help. side, we, we have, sorry, but we, we have been uh, more on terms of uh, automation side and, and some of our smaller sites though on maybe you know looking at some real-time bidding. Uh, for some sites that haven't really uh, been standing standing on their own two feet for, for that long a period of time. Um, earlier this year, ABC announced our first test of programmatic or really data-driven targeting on a reserve basis against our premium video inventory. And it, it literally is an operational test. We're just wrapping it up uh, now with seven partners. And so that's sort of been our first foray in the video space. Um, beyond that, and I think Dan brought mm -hmm. this up very well, which is that programmatic is such a big word. Yeah. Um, it, it encompasses such a large umbrella of activities. And so that's really on the video advertising side for us. I think beyond that, the backroom automation, the idea of taking the manual nature of our business and making it just a smaller piece, that, that's important and that's something all of us are focused on. And that's actually work that has been going on for you know, the past two years at ABC that I've been there and continues to go on, and I'm sure that's probably the case across the board. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Mark, uh, what, what unique opportunities can broadcasters offer advertisers that want to connect their brand? We heard an example about Audi <laughs> er earlier, but a specific brand to a specific show, and how can you potentially extend that both from online and, and offline? Sure, I mean, I think there's, uh, you know, we've been doing integrated sales for a very, very long time, right? Building, you know, people's brands into our programming. I think everybody else on the panel as well, right? So there are lots of opportunities. It really does depend on a show-by-show -show basis and what the unique opportunity is. I mean, there's obviously going to be different opportunities in shows like Survivor and Big Brother than there are on things like The Good Wife and, and others, but there's opportunities in all, and those can extend in the video wherever that video plays. So I think that's the, that's the first core way, you know, people can become involved in the shows. And then I think online, I mean, obviously, you can buy show by show, you know, with us from on a, you know, you can buy show pages, you can buy nights, you can buy sections, you can buy all those places. Uh, but then I think it's about trying to find the right, you know, type of integration that really can be impactful for the advertisers. And, I, and I'll use uh, sports and I'll use football as a, as a great example. Our fantasy platform uh, provides a tremendous opportunity for brands to integrate into uh, a live programming piece that happens on our network and also something that extends beyond the day. Right? It's not just about Sunday with fantasy, it's about every day. We run a live uh, streamed program every day of the week called Fantasy Football Today where our experts are rating the players <laughs> and ranking them and that's been sponsored by different advertisers each year but we've had, you know, I think last year was a Subway Pick of the Week. I think the, this year and last year I think we've been doing the State Farm, you know, double check your lineup. You know, all these things that can really integrate into how that brand is perceived and what they're doing on a weekly basis, uh, what these players are doing on a weekly basis with NFL football for us. So. And that's just one example, and I think I'm sure we all have different ones of how you can integrate a sponsor into each show, but it's about having that you know, relationship with the brand, understanding what they want to get out of it, and then you know, delivering it into something that really makes sense you know, for them. Thank you. Um, this one gets a little bit more into, into measurement and, and also buying. A lot of traditional media has purchased um, age and gender uh, basis, and that started, and Nielsen's kind of led this, that's starting to move into <laughs> online with OCR and Comscore has VCE. Is, is, that, is that how we should do online targeting? Is that the right way to approach it, Pooja? Um, so I think that how a marketer should approach targeting and what makes sense is really driven by the campaign and the campaign objectives. 
you know, what, what, what are the KPIs of the advertiser? That's probably the first thing to consider when determining what's the appropriate targeting. Um, and I think that there is a very solid argument to be made for why you know, behavioral targeting can be, in certain cases, richer or more important than traditional measures of age and gender. Um, and I, I definitely feel that way. But the thing that we have to keep in mind is that right now, in the cross-screen world that we operate in and we live in, age and gender are really what we're best able to measure across all of the platforms that the campaigns we're generally working with are on. And so they play a very important role in being a common denominator for an advertiser so that you can actually compare cross-platform effectiveness, campaign performance, and really look at something in its totality. You know, that said, it's still not perfect. And I would say that we are pushing, and I think um, the broadcast networks together are really pushing Comscore and Nielsen for better measurement technologies, richer solutions. And as much as we're pushing them in the industry, they were also pushing ourselves. So we are testing and we are experimenting ourselves with how we can bring data-driven solutions to bear for our advertisers against our premium video inventory. You know, we feel like there is richness there, there is value there. We just need to find the right way to unlock that. Got it. Dan, thoughts? Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this <laughs> one. You know, I, I think every time I sit and listen to quarterly results coming from Facebook or Google, it's not about age and sex. It's about richer demographics that they're purporting to be able to report to advertisers. And I think if we don't all embrace the notion that we have to go richer beyond age and sex, we're all going to lose. Um, we um, are already starting down that road. We launched a product called um, NBCU Plus, powered by Comcast, where we're actually merging fantastic distribution from Comcast that fuels great information and data with great content. Um, we've had um, great success um, bringing charter advertisers into that in the upfront. We feel like it's the way that all of us have to go um, or we're all going to lose. And I think if you extend that, um, and that, that's by the way on the linear platform, if you extend that notion to digital, um, what we're all talking about, rich digital video, it's a $3 billion business right now. Um, and it's supposed to grow to $8 billion by 2018, if you <clears throat> believe all the forecasts. That $5 billion VIG is ours to get or to give to somebody else. And it's not going to be gotten on age and sex. It's going to be gotten based on being able to deliver rich demographic and psychographic information. So we all have to band together and figure out how to do it. Uh, George, um, we, we talked a little bit about o OTT, but, but mobile is obviously the other area that's growing very rapidly. Um, talk a little bit about your approach and, and how you best leverage the mobile environment. Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, really it, it was, became the natural extension with the technological evolution and not only the purchase of phones, but just the, the availability now on a video screen. And uh, I think for us, uh, you know, we've, Obviously, I think we all played in the web space. That was just an absolute getting you right to your website experience. And now, you know, our, you know, 10 years ago, Fox.com was a marketing website. We were show sites, and we were telling people, if you went to the website, when to watch it on TV. We developed into the derivative content we spoke of, and then we started getting into full episodes. When we first jumped into the mobile space, we tried to make our app very similar to our website. Try to do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And you know, what we've seen is it's hard to really manage that. And what we did with our uh, re-release on iOS and what we're going to be doing with Android uh, in January and have currently with Xbox on, and Windows is really just said, figured <laughs> out, why are people going to the mobile app? And they're going to watch full episode players, and they want recency of the Gotham that was on Monday. So when they go Tuesday, right now we just have changed the architecture, changed the design, changed the functionality. You just get right to it. So we've just really created a, a seamless user flow with an understanding that the, the overwhelming majority of people that come to our app are looking for full episode content. You know, we've seen probably doubled our, uh, our stream rate since we've really moved to that model. You know, clearly I think we're all, uh, you know, on the operations front, it's important to make sure that we've got quality controls in place. There's still so many different devices, so many different bandwidth areas. And on the ad front, um, you know, it's a, Technological innovation to distribute content, and it's achievable, but it takes time and it takes effort and it takes the building of resources. The introduction of ads 
is just a whole other level of that evolution. So we're constantly trying to figure that out to make sure we're not disrupting our content by the introduction of ads. So a lot of server-side stitching that you know, our, our operations team is just constantly dedicated to. Great. Brian? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's by far the biggest explosion for our network. And you don't have to look much first, further than two weeks ago when, when Apple announces a new device that is bigger and probably a better viewing experience. There's 10 million new devices being sold in the first weekend. Um, it's a huge opportunity for more viewers to get into the pipeline, to download our apps, to watch our programming. Um, and so, you know, I look back two years ago, we just looked at research, 80% of our inventory on the digital front was laptop, desktop. Look two years later, we're already at a 50-50 split. And it's going to explode on the, on the, digital, on the uh, mobile front because it's just a much more um, easier device to use. Um, so we're excited about mobile, and obviously we're using it to the best of our ability. Yeah, and I think the, the great news this season is that you know, OCR and VC are now here. So yeah, you can actually right. demographically yeah. measure that mobile traffic for the first time. And so really the only demographic gaps are on cable VOD, which hopefully will come sometime <laughs> next year, and, and, and OTT really fitting into an outside the C3 window demographic measurement. So now you have mobile and desktop, you've really got a nice you know, measurable package there that makes it really easy to get. Right, and, and instead of using the OCR comps that we were using for, to, for the mobile delivery, now you're actually going to get the real younger viewer. I think we're all going to see a little bit of a slightly younger audience that is tapping into watching the programming now that it's being measured correctly on those d devices. I saw a stat recently that said um, 40 million U.S. households now have uh, connected television. Now, I'm, I'm sure they're not all connected, right? If you buy a new TV from Best Buy, you may not even realize it's a connected TV. But 40 million households, that's a, that's a huge number. How is that impacting changing things, right? Now, now the biggest screen in the house is just another connected device, just like the tablet and the mobile phone and the, and the laptop. How does that change the landscape for this group and, and, and how you approach the consumer? Anyone? George? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's... Been significant, you know. We the, the the mobile growth we were just speaking of that for us, and I think as we're moving into over the top, it's that is exactly going to overtake mobile. I think in terms of growth for us, where uh, you know we were on Roku, Xbox, and Samsung for probably the last year, year and a half. Uh, over the summer, we launched on Apple TV, uh, Google Chromecast, and Kindle, and just when we just like we did with our app on mobile when we rejiggered it to be more content friendly we double participation we're, we're double now uh, or a little over double participation on OTT so that's going to continue to grow it is that exact experience I can't wait for you know some of the ad serving capabilities to catch up you know vast v paid compliance uh, and measurement to catch up with that because right now and, and it, it's it's a gap and I think this gap in these certifications hurts all of us you know you can look at us as just revenue people and we say well those are missed revenue opportunities but really what they are they're misbranding opportunities so if anyone's being hamstrung with an inability to run in OTT where there's just now a plethora of impressions you know we've been in this business for a long time and even when we started full episode player there were some concerns in the very beginning that hey I don't people don't watch full <laughs> episodes online you know it's a short form and we all kind of championed that and technology caught up and made the experience great but at first, there wasn't great scale. And so some people would say, eh, I don't need to be there because it's not worth my time or it's not worth my investment. And you know what? They weren't so wrong in the beginning. It wasn't. In, but with growth, it's now become the play, you know, a place where you need to be for, for appropriate branding. But I think really in the drop of a hat, or whatever that saying is, that <laughs> OTT has got this scale for, across the entire world. Like I would never say, oh, just buy Fox long form on Apple TV. I would say. If you're participating in full episode digital video across the spectrum of publishers, well, you should include OTT as part of that, or you're missing a non-duplicated audience. I think there's also a great point in that, that, that the traffic's not just big around full episode inventory on these devices, which is what you would think. Oh, yeah, it's long form. I'm going to sit back. It's going to be a passive experience just on that. Uh, I know you mentioned something about ABC News. I mean, we launched our, our CBS News app on Roku, I think, nine months ago or something like that. And, and you know, we had minimal expectations. I'll put it as like, this could be interesting, let's go see what it is. It's now as big as our largest distribution partner off of cbsnews.com, which is YouTube. So CBS News is as big on Roku itself as it is on all of YouTube. YouTube with a, you know, 200 million you know, users and Roku with 10 million devices. What it tells you is that 
they're not just watching, they're like leaving it on and watching and watching. And that's, that's a great experience. That now you're having a TV-like experience with essentially <laughs> short form content. Because all we put up there is, is clips at this point for CBS News, although we have you know, something more coming later yeah. on. I, I would add, I, I do think it's, it's, this, it's a great on-demand platform for viewers. And it's a great on-demand platform for programmers. So everyone has rich archives here. Everyone you know, at this table has creative executives that hear countless really amazing pitches and only have so many hours to program in a linear environment. Um, and so I just feel like it's, it's going to create you know, incredible new opportunities for us to program beyond just you know, our, our core stable of products. And in that sense, it's going to be very important. But I also think if you bring it back to um, the actual broadcast networks and, and the linear television viewing experience, in a weird way, I think all of these OTT opportunities have raised the game. We heard it earlier on one of the mm -hmm. on the, the producers panel. You know, Dana talked about it, and so did Warren about. You know, Dana talked about eventizing weeks, and Warren talked about the fact that he had to convince Dick that you know sometimes we have to get people to want to watch tonight, not just any other night. And what we, we're seeing now, I think, is the golden age of great television. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody can argue that there's some of the best TV available out there, despite the fact that one might argue all of these producers are spread thin across all these different platforms. We're getting great content because the competition is rising. Great. Uh, join me in thanking our panel. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <clears throat>